Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week... Seven Secrets, number one, from Boom Studios. Another new comic book from Boom Studios. This one is written by Tom Taylor. It's got artwork by Danielle D. Nicciolo, who was a former artist on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Another really solid book from Boom. In fact, Boom has not just been killing it this year and last year in comic book stores. They're killing it this week. And for me, Seven Secrets, number one, is the pick of the week. I loved it this book so much. I have actually had the luxury of reading issues one and two, and together they make a great one-two punch that instantaneously had me hooked and compelled and captivated by the story. The basic premise is this. There are seven secrets that have been guarded by this mysterious organization for millennia, possibly, right? And so each secret has a carrier and like a handler or something like that. Two people guarding one secret, right? And people were always after these secrets for nefarious reasons. Well, without spoiling too much, this is about a mistake that two of these people make, and now maybe the secrets are a bit more in danger. I had a lot of fun with this one. The artwork had a great dynamic flow of energy that really just absolutely captured the action-packed nature of the story. Meanwhile, Tom Taylor completely nails the humanization of the characters. Even though the characters are badass and they're caught in this crazy, high-concept type world, this crazy thing, they very much resonate as real characters, as real down-to-earth. This book has humor, it's got action, but it also has triumph and tragedy. It's got, it's got pain and sadness in it as well, but it's all done in a very incredibly subtle nature. It's something Tom Taylor does great. He is just killing it right now, Tom Taylor is. The artwork's fire. I really like it. The only problem with the first issue is that it ends very abruptly. I think this would hit harder if issues one and two were actually one full giant-sized issues, but I can tell you this, having read issue number two, I know where the story's going, and it is so much fun, but at the same time, meaningful. Seven Secrets, number one, the next hit from Boom, out this week. It's the pick of the week. Also from Boom, man, they got a week this week. They won the week. I'm just going to say that. Something is Killing the Children, issue number nine. Holy cow, what a great freaking issue. James Tiny and the Fourth has been doing an amazing job with the story of being able to not just retread the same type stuff. When we start hitting the second arc of Something is Killing the Children, it can be, the story can be put in the danger of kind of just repeating itself. And even though there are some elements of that repetition, it's like even crazier, more tragic, more wow factor than it was in the first arc. I love it. Werther Del Edadera's artwork is so perfect for the tone and atmosphere of this book, adding with the coloring by Miguel Muerto. Holy cow, this book is eerie. It's crazy. Now, I know a lot of people, including myself, thought that the last couple issues kind of slowed up just a little bit, but it ramps that horrific action right back up in issue number nine. And we learn a whole lot more about the character of Erica Slaughter in a very compelling type way. I love this issue. I love the series. This is a great issue. The best of the second arc so far, in my opinion, just really blew me away this week. And that coloring, holy cow, is absolutely amazing. Issue number nine of Something is Killing the Children. Alienated number five is here. A pretty solid issue. Not as solid as... Four or three. Three and four were like absolutely mind blowing. Now the story's taking a little bit of a different turn, a little bit of a, a turn that you can see coming, but at the same time, still very unnerving to watch it unwrap and develop. This book is really good, and it's making a strong case to be one of the best books of the year. And with the giant gut punch that was three and four, I knew it would be hard for five to live up to that hype. But it's still an absolutely fantastic issue, exploring into the character yet again of another one of these Sams, and I'm loving it. It doesn't quite have the punch of three and four, like I said, but... It is, on its own, and by its own merit, a fantastic and solid issue. Simon Spurrier is killing it with this, taking all the sides of being a teenager, feeling alienated, just being a person in this world, and feeling 
alone, feeling like you're not seen and you're not heard. And this really does some really cool thematic stuff through the story and through the meaning behind the story, the subtext, if you will, about that whole being seen and heard thing. And I really, really like it. Um, it's starting to really get to a point where this alien artifact, um, you're starting to feel for it now and starting to understand the danger that's present towards Chip, which Chip is this alien that these three kids come in contact with, and now they share a telepathic connection with one another, and they all, each in their own way, feel outcast and other and ostracized from, from their classmates and from society a, as a whole at times. Alienated number five is capped, capped by absolutely fantastic artwork. Chris Wild, Goose, Andre May, they are killing it artistically on this book. Very interesting um, layouts and design, a great flow of energy throughout the book. I have a lot of fun with this one, and issue five is great. Like I said, though, maybe not as emotionally resonant or as strong as three and four, but still a great issue nonetheless. We also have Red Mother. That's right. The Red Mother issue number seven is here. I know a lot of people feel like this book is too slow of a burn. I love the pace of this book. It has room to breathe. It has room to let that tension build. It has room to let the slow terror start creeping in, not just to the character, but to us as the readers. I'm loving it. Incredibly clean line work, very precise, um, great composition there. The way this t story is told, the coloring, it's very effective. I'm loving this book. It is a very slow burn. But even if you thought that second arc was starting off way too slow, after the crazy reveal at the end of the last issue, it adds a new element of danger to the story. And this has fantastic artwork, and it really, to me, was just one of the best issues of Red Mother yet. I loved it. The main character, she's been dealing with some with some struggles, with some trauma. She's trying to finally feel like she's getting beyond that, but it ain't gonna stop. There's something haunting her. There's something coming after her, and it's still coming. It's still slow. It's still slow burn, but I'm loving it. I love the atmosphere. I love the pace. I love the tone. Red Mother number seven out this week. From Boom Studios, let's jump over to DC Comics. Death Metal, that's right, Dark Knights, Death Metal number three. Holy frickin' smokes, I loved this issue. Almost made the pick of the week. Boom's got some solid ones, though. But yet another solid issue of Death Metal. And now it's really starting to feel like a crisis-appropriate type event. You got so many things going on. And you already had a lot of stuff going on in, in this book. And Snyder and Capullo are having so much fun with it. And that fun just leaks off of the page and into my heart while I'm reading this. I feel like a kid reading Secret Wars again for the first time. Or Infinity Gauntlet. Or Crisis on Infinite Earths. I didn't read that as a kid. I probably went way over my head. Anyway, this is a very fun book. The creators are having fun. I'm having fun with it. Superman is back in this issue. What's been up with him? What's been going on? Why does he look like this? Why has he got a dark side arm? You find out a lot of that stuff in here. Some really cool revelations. Some really cool moments in here as well. And some very crisis specific type moments. You always got to have a part in a crisis where the flashes have to run right? You get what I'm saying? And I'm absolutely loving this book. It's, it's obnoxious at times. It is ridiculous. It is absurd. But at the same time, it is absolutely slam bang, fantastic, boisterous, loud, in your face. And that's what it should be. Like I said, Snyder and Capullo and the rest of the team, they're having so much fun with this book. And I am having so much fun reading it. The Batman who laughs is such a larger threat than he ever has been, and I'm eating up every single page with him on it. You got the Robin King in this issue, and I'm going to tell you this. It's not just hype. I mean, the hype was just hype, because nobody knew. But the Robin King? Ha! <laughs> what a crazy, eerie, and chilling character. I absolutely love the scene in this one. With the Robin King and the Flashes, oh my goodness. I could gush over death metal for hours. I really could. I love it. I have already loved what Snyder and them have been doing. And the, the initial metal was fun, and I like it, but this is much more of a DC crisis, and it feels big, multiversal, incredibly epic in scope, in scale, and the stakes have never been higher at times for the DC universe. Literally, everything could come to an end, and I'm having so much fun watching it unfold, plus the heroism that's displayed in this issue through these dire circumstances, just building up from what Snyder had already established in Justice League, this is it, and I'm loving it. 
Dark Knight's Death Metal. <laughs> Issue number three out this week. Detective Comics is here with 1,025. The official first Joker War tie-in from Detective Comics. Everything else was prelude to the Joker War, if you will. This is an okay issue. Kind of spotlights Kate Kane's Batwoman. Um, Kenneth Rockefort's on the artwork, and actually some really solid artwork from him. Um, usually I, I criticize his artwork as being too, too, too space, too, too much space, not enough panels per page, not enough, uh, complexity in the design, just a lot of shortcuts here and there. All that's kind of out the window in this issue, and it's a really solid, um, densely packed in issue artistically and story-wise. Story, it's okay. It's Peter Tomasi's doing an okay, inconsistent at times, though, job on Detective Comics. Like I said, this one mostly focuses in on Batwoman, but it does have some Batman action as well, and some developments in what's going on with Lucius Fox during the Joker War. But if you feel like you got to get every single pit, bit of the Joker War, you got to get this one. It's not completely necessary, but it does have some developments that probably will impact future issues of Batman just slightly. Detective Detective Comics 1025 is out this week. Batman and the Outsiders number 15. Let's keep the bat train going. Uh, Batman and the Outsiders number 15 is a pretty solid issue. It's ramping up. I like seeing Brian Hill's take on Ra's al Ghul. I think he's doing a great job building up a big threat, a big, a big force, um, and I'm loving it so much. Dexter Soy's artwork is so energetic. I just absolutely love it. This title will be coming to an end soon, and that's unfortunate because I've actually been liking this one, and there's been some nice character building, especially in the relationship between Katana and Black Lightning. Lightning, though it does feel at times like there's not enough character work in the midst of everything else going on. But Brian Hill is writing what seems to be a really cool action book with that character development, even though there, I feel like maybe there could be a little bit more. There's actually probably just enough, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Batman the Outsiders and Black Lightning's about to level up, y'all. It's about to level up. <laughs> the Batman's Grave issue number nine is here. Holy cow, I love this issue. Now that we're starting to get more of a hang on what's actually going on, um, because what's really kept me engaged on this is the relationship between Bruce and Alfred. Written by Warren Ellis, it's done splendidly well. This is a one of the best written Alfreds in years, in my opinions. Um, but Brian Hitch is able to really stage these great action scenes that are brutal, sleek, and cool at the same time. And that's no exception to issue number nine. After the really fun ending of issue number eight, in which Batman says, I'm the new warden now, we pick right up from that. It's got explosive action. It's got brutal fight scenes in it. And now the story is becoming a bit more clear and the pacing of it's a bit more precise. And I'm actually having so much fun with the Batman's grave. I'm going to be sad to see it end at issue number nine, but alas, it was set up to be a miniseries. Issue number nine is out this week. Brian Hitch continuing to pump out great artwork, um, and I'm loving it. Batman's Grave number nine out this week. Flash 759 is the first part of Finish Line which is the final Flash story arc from Josh Williamson. It's going to be really sad to see him leave the title because he has just been building this up from a, a decent title into a must-read at DC, and now it's all come together. It's all culminating in this issue, in this storyline. Reverse Flash has control of Barry's body. The, he's got other rogues involved, the League of Zoom. There's t there's all other Flashes are involved, but it's, it's the perfect encapsulation and pinpoint of everything that... Williamson and company have been building up to. Sandoval's artwork is so splendidly fantastic and captures the motion and movement and momentum needed for a Flash book. I'm loving this book so much. The only problem I had with 759 is that it's the start of Josh Williamson's final arc. I want to see his run go on for five more years. Seriously, this book is so good and one of DC's most consistent books out right now, superhero-wise, and I'm loving it. Flash 759 out this week. Wonder Woman 760 is out this week. This is the second issue by Mariko Tamaki. Um, I thought the first issue was pretty decent. Had some nice thematic stuff going on, and, and Mikhail Hanen was actually doing some really cool composition and some nice spacious design work and layouts and whatnot. And I liked it. I thought it was pretty solid, and it brought back one of my fan favorite, one of the Robbie favorite fan favorite villains of the, the, uh, the recent uh, era of DC. Not recent, like super recent, but since like the year 2000, whatever. It's got Maxwell Lord in it. So that's super, super cool. Somebody's using psychic powers to disrupt things. Diana thinks it's Max Lord. He claims it's not. And now she's possibly even being manipulated herself. Issue 760, which is the second issue of Tamaki's run, I loved. I loved it even more than the first one. I thought the first one was decent, but this one kind of blew me away. I really liked it. The artwork was cleaner, more concise, more precise even, I should say. Um, it was great. It was a great experience, and it was cool. I've been itching to get a Wonder Woman book that 
I was really captivated by. And that hasn't happened since Greg Rucka. And now, two issues in, I'm really captivated. There are some cliche superhero y type things in here. There's a great reveal at the end, but when you really start thinking about it, you're like, we've seen this story many times before. So now it comes to see how they're going to pay this off. And I hope they pay it off well because the setup has been splendid and took me by surprise. But Wonder Woman, pretty solid right now. Superman 24, wish I could say the same thing, did not like this issue whatsoever. I was a little bit intrigued with issue number 23 of this new person that they introduced. It's like a new villain right there. To me, that just looks like Cosmic Ghost Rider. Doesn't act like Cosmic Ghost Rider, so that's cool. But this wasn't interesting to me whatsoever. Bendis' direction on the Superman books, I've just not been a fan of. I really liked it towards the beginning, but it's just completely lost me. It feels like it's meandering around, just doing silly things and the weight of the story has been lost, at least to me. I know some people are liking the super books, but I'm just not doing it right now. Even Kevin Maguire's artwork is not quite as solid or as or as clean as I'm used to seeing, but Superman number 24, yet another super dud for me. I'm just not digging it. The Green Lantern season two, issue number six, man, man, oh man. I want Grant Morrison to just continue writing this book as long as he wants, especially if Liam Sharp's on board to do all the artwork. This book is so much fun. I've said this before many times. I'll say it again, once again, and I'll probably say it again. Grant Morrison, Liam Sharp, Steve Olaf are veterans in this industry, and they're cranking out work like they're brand new, hungry creators, ready to tell something new, daring, and different and bold, and I'm absolutely loving it. This has been a different take on Green Lantern, but it's also been exactly a great take on Green Lantern. It's basically just single-issue cop stories in space, but with that kooky, weird, cosmic craziness that only Grant Morrison and Liam Sharp can provide, and this one is a great one. You got the typical idea of, of an infirmary, of a hospital, uh, taking care of police, right, when they're injured, and now we're starting to see what Morrison's actually building up in the overall structure of season two, and I'm really hooked into it, and I'm loving Liam Sharp's artwork. It's grisly and detailed, and it's got a lot of texture and grit and dirt to it, and it makes space look grimy. Sometimes I love a sleek, futuristic-looking space sci-fi story, and sometimes I want it to look grimy and dirty and, and nasty. You know what I'm saying? And that's what you're getting out of Green Lantern right now. I'm having so much fun with the story. The stakes just got risen to a whole other level, and I'm excited to see what's going to be coming. And we got Justice League Odyssey, J-Lo, issue number 23 here. It's a pretty solid issue. I feel like it's been kind of losing its way just the last few issues, but really what's happened is the story's just taken a step back. But now in this issue, it's ramped right back up. Maybe that was all intentional so that when you read it all together, you get a little bit of a lull to this slam bang issue right here. If you're a Dark Side fan, like I am, you do not want to miss this issue of Just League Odyssey. Now, I would recommend reading all of it so you know what exactly is going on, but there's some great dark side moments in this issue that are huge and explosive and totally deserving of the character. Plus, you got Jessica Cruz, you got Cyborg. Finally, some of the stuff is finally coming full circle because the book is nearing its end, so it's about time to start wrapping this stuff up, bring everything back together and up to a pinpoint of a head of a needle. What? That didn't make any sense. Basically, though, they're building up to the finale. They're doing a great job and some majorly awesome dark side bits in there. Thought that was amazing. Next up, we're going to jump over to Marvel with Venom, issue number 27, Donny Cates. We know it already. Donny Cates has been doing a great job on Venom. This is no exception. I got the variant cover for this one because both covers were done by Stegman, but that one's just so cool. I really, really liked it. So you do, yeah, blah, blah. You do got some virus action in here. Um, after the end of last issue, Eddie and Dylan and Virus are thrown into an alternate reality. It is somehow... Venom and Null related, of course, because it just has to be so that you know the level of the threat that's coming up. Like, we don't already know how big of a deal the King in Black is going to be. Um, no revelations on exactly who Virus is or anything like that, but a really cool, fun issue, and I really did like it. Um, the artwork was not my favorite, though. It's all right. It's Juan Gideon. Um, I mean, it's hard to kind of take over from Ryan Stegman. Ryan Stegman's artwork is just so explosive and dynamic, especially on the Venom title. And this artwork, to me, felt a little rushed and unclear and cluttered at times, but it did get the job done. The story still engaged me all the way through. I had a lot of fun with this issue. I had some nice, fun, quirky surprises. And I'm still trying to piece together who I think Virus is. Who do you think he is? Let me know in the comments down below. But Venom number 27 is out this week, and I had a lot of fun with it like I've been having on Venom. 
Empire, number five is here. The penultimate issue of Empire. The best thing I can say about this is that it means we're closer to the end. Now, I know a lot of people in the PCP Army have been like an Empire. They've been defending it, and that's fine, and that's cool. But for me, to be a big event, this just doesn't cut it. just doesn't have what it takes. The threat doesn't feel severe. It doesn't feel like it's got the weight that it should have for justifying all these tie-ins, and it feels way overloaded. And I know it's all coming out faster than it was originally intended to, but the story's just not there, and it's not pulling me in. It's very predictable. And I'm just not really digging it that much. And if the if this story goes where I think it's going, I'm not going to be super, super pleased in some of the ramifications for the future of the Fantastic Four. However, Empire number 5, eh, it's alright. Still, once again, kind of setting up this Immortal Hulk thing, but it, I don't think that's going to be that big of a deal. But... It's just dull, it's lackluster, and it just, I mean, they even canceled like probably half the tie-ins, but it still feels like overload, but I'm just not digging it at all. We got Empire Avengers number two. Um, if I'm not like an if I'm not like an Empire, what I'm liking even less are these meaningless, worthless tie-ins. Seriously, Kazar fans, you might want to check this out. If you're like the most hardcore Kazar fan, where you get everything connected to Kazar, you might want to pick this one up. Aside from that, just skip it. It's worthless. It's meaningless. I don't care. I think they're trying to use these tie-ins to add the scope into Empire, but it's just not working for me. Then we got this Captain America one. Issue number two. Oh my goodness. This is dull. It's boring. It literally has nothing to do. I guess it's been the next issue of Empire. We see a giant plant monster. We'll know where it came from, but that's about it. I really don't like this book. I really am not liking the Empire books. Um, I thought the first issue of Empire was pretty solid, but I don't know. Captain Marvel was already starting to become a dull title for me, and I decided to stick it through a little bit longer to make it through the Empire tie-ins, and I really don't care. The new character that was introduced in the last issue, that's intriguing, and that's cool. So there are some bits involving that character in this issue that I did like a little bit, but overall, like, I'm just not... Like It's a big, Carol's got a hammer, she's wearing green. Ooh, who cares? I don't care. Captain Marvel number 19, another dud as far as Empire goes. But the X-Men Empire tie-ins have been pretty fun. Why? Because they actually read like X-Men books and not like Empire tie-ins. Yeah, you got plants, but you got plants versus zombies versus mutants. And that's really, really cool. You got the entire writing team of all the X-Books jumping in all at once. So you don't have a, a, a cohesive voice that's used. I thought issue one was better and issue two was worse than issue one, but it was still good. And issue three is a little bit worse than issue two, but it's still pretty good and it's still pretty fun. You got some nice fun night crawler moments in here and I like that. So out of all the Empire stuff, the only stuff I've really been liking have been the X-Men tie-ins and it's just because I'm kind of enthralled with the world of the X-Men right now. Speaking of the world of the X-Men, Marauders is here with issue number 11. This is the issue I've been waiting for. We're finally going to res like really uh, what's the word? We're finally going to uh, pay attention to what's going on with Kate. We're finally going to get some revelations maybe about what's been going on. This was a great issue. This was a really good issue that had a lot of heart to it, had a lot of substance to it, and at the same time was a great turning point into where this book is going to go, and I had a lot of fun. This is an issue I've been waiting for. Marauders has been one of my favorite X-Men books. There's X-Men, there's X-Force, and there's Marauders. Those are the ones I think are the strongest out of all the books, and this is no exception. Some great Storm bits here, but even some better Emma Frost bits. Seriously, the work being done with Emma Frost is exceptional by Duggan and company in here. I had so much fun with this one. I'm loving it, and I'm ready now for this book to get back in full force. X-Force number 11, this is the other X-Men book that's not X-Men by Jonathan Hickman that I'm absolutely adoring. Benjamin Percy and company are doing a great job on X-Force. Issue number 11 is no exception. Um, because of the shutdown, I've heard a lot of people not being as into the X-Men books as they were before the shutdown, and I think it's because there's so much going on in each one of these books that it's kind of difficult to keep track of as they're you know, trucking along like normal, but then you add in like a three, four month shutdown and it kind of throws some stuff off. So I definitely want to sit down and reread, especially X-Men Marauders and X-Force, but this was a great issue of X-Force. It's got a great Quentin Quire scene that had me laugh out loud. Um, it's got some great action, some Colossus work that's really cool. And I really like this relationship that's building up between Domino and Colossus, this friendship, this understanding that they have. And and how that's all kind of wrapped up into the purpose of X-Force. But Benjamin Percy's making a, a violent book that also has humor, but also it's got 
that that touch of human drama, or should I say, mutant drama. The Immortal Hulk issue number 36 is out. Uh, a decent issue. I like this one. It's got some great artwork by Joe Bennett. It gets a little bit more into the horror side of things, and I like that a little bit better. You get like arms being ripped off and things like that, and, and I really liked it. I thought it was pretty solid. But the Hulk right now for me is an inconsistent book. Sometimes it's like one of the best books of the of the week, and other times it's just kind of forgettable and kind of mediocre and just kind of run of the mill. And I know that's a weird thing to say for a book that everybody was so hyped on for being so unique and different in its vision, but now it's just kind of this is one where I think it's a little bit better, but it's still an inconsistent book. We were talking about that on the Everything Comics channel. Um, we had our monthly comic book best month, you know, comic book meetup, whatever you want to call it. And uh, we were talking about it. We're all kind of getting to the point where Immortal Hulk feels like it's kind of losing its way just a little bit. I know it's planned for 50 issues, but maybe it should have only been 40 and trying to get to more punch real quickly. But I don't know. Immortal Hulk number 36 was, was good. But it wasn't great. Um, Amazing Spider-Man 46 is here. I'm not the biggest fan of what Nick Spencer's been doing on Amazing Spider-Man. Though I will say that this was a pretty decent and intriguing issue. It had some pretty nifty artwork through it. But it's not going to like change your mind on Spider-Man and be like, You know what, man? I was completely wrong. Nick Spencer's Spider-Man is the best ever. Because I don't think that's the case. But this new Sin Eater story is slowly starting to become a bit more intriguing to me. So I'm, I'm down for the long haul. You know, it's just the way it is. But it also utilizes some of my favorite villains. Mostly Iron Man villains like uh, Living Laser. Is that Living Laser? Yes, yeah, Living Laser. Grey Gargoyle and Whirlwind. I love Whirlwind and Grey Gargoyle in particular. Um, mostly because of the Iron Man Marvel Action Hour cartoon series from the mid-90s, which I have. And I still have some toys from it, and I, and I love that stuff. Anyway, Amazing Spider-Man 46, a decent issue. It's okay. It's pretty interesting. The Sin, the Sin Eater stuff is more interesting to me than than some of the other Spencer stuff. Hawkeye Freefall, issue number five. That's right, it's back, it's back. They said that it was not going to be printed, but it is, and I'm glad it is, because Matthew Rosenberg, Otto Schmidt, have been doing a great job with the character and with the story, making something um, kinetic, um, action-packed, and at the same time, fun. But it's not like making fun of Clint. Clint is still a badass, but at the same time, he's still that lovable loser that we know from the Matt Fraction run. It's kind of like the best of both worlds. I'm having a lot of fun with this one. It's got the hood involved. It's got Kingpin, though Kingpin's kind of... Doesn't look like Kingpin. He looks more like Lex Luthor. Like, you lose some weight. Otto Schmidt, did he lose some weight? Anyway, Hawkeye Freefall, I'm really glad that it's back. Issue 5 is a great setup to what I believe is the finale. I believe Issue 6 is the final one. Um, but I really liked it and thought it was really cool. And now that the mystery of who the new Ronin is has already been, you know, blown out for us readers, now the threat is ramped up and I'm having a lot of fun with this book. Let's jump over to some independent comic books from Aftershock. Undone by Blood or The Shadow of a Wanted Man, issue number 5. This is the final issue of this book. Not the final issue of the series, because they announced in this book that in 2021 the series is returning. So that's really, really nifty with a whole new story, a new cast of characters and everything. But this brings this whole story to a very satisfying and, and, and I would say obvious ending, but it is the ending that this story deserves and I had a lot of fun with it. The artwork by Sammy Cavella, the composition, the layouts, the panel design is absolutely stunning. The color work by Jason Wordy, adding this grit. It's a more modernized um, Western, but it still has this Western that's like more old school and both stories kind of overlap as far as thematic relevance goes and I think that that's absolutely fantastic. Um, Lonnie Nadler, Zach Thompson, they killed it on this one. Hassan Osman El Hal with the lettering is just an absolute perfect ending to what has been a near perfect modern western. Even though it's set like in the 70s or the early 80s or something like that. But if you've been enjoying Undone by Blood, I think you're going to be really pleased with the finale and I could not be more excited for the news that it will be returning next year in some form or another. Also from Aftershock, we have Join the Future, issue number four. This has been such a great book. I'm loving it. And issue four was exceptionally cool. I feel like a lot, each issue has something big that happens, but that's usually all that happens. This one to me actually explores this world a little bit more um, about what's going on. It, it reveals some of its history. It reveals some of the past and it does so in a very... Um, clever way I think just simply through scenery and slight bits of dialogue here and there that are like subtle hints of what's come before and what's possibly even to come later but I'm having a lot of fun with this one this is a great book with great artwork it's about 
this crazy futuristic city where everything's taken care of, right? All you got to do is just join up. Some people feel like that may be losing their freedom, their freedom to choose the life that they want out there on the frontier, making their own way, living off the land, stuff like that. This woman has had her whole way of life and family and community ripped away from her by this big, giant mega city um, whose promises just nothing but peace and love to everybody. Um, so you're starting to see cracks um, in that facade. You're starting to see the hypocritical nature of this society. And you're also starting to see what it's doing to this character. And it's turning her into an absolutely badass action hero is what it's doing. And Join the Future number 4 was an exceptional issue. From Image Comics, we got a new one called Big Girls. Big Girls number one is written and uh, illustrated by Jason Howard. Jason Howard is the artist of Trees. He's the artist of Cemetery Beach. I like him. He's got a very frantic, rushed, fast-paced type style that's really usually good for sci-fi action uh, books, right? Big Girls is his own creation, and it's about a world where some people, after they turn three years old, start growing and growing and turning into these giant like monsters, kind of like kaiju or something, right? Except for the women. The women maintain their humanity, but all the men turn into these giant monsters. So in order to fight off these giant monsters and keep society safe, they use the big girls as like shields, as giant fighters. So you got giant monsters and then you got giant women just fighting it out. And it's pretty cool. It's got some great artwork. I really liked it. It's a scratchy, rough type style to it. But for me, it absolutely works for the flow of this story of Jason Howard doing what Jason Howard likes to do. The story was captivating. It was interesting. It wasn't the best book of the week, but it certainly wasn't the worst. It was really solid and definitely worth you checking out if it sounds interesting to you. So Nada is here with issue number tw uh, 12. I almost said number 3. Number three. Um, Sonata number 12 is here. This is pretty much a mostly silent issue. Um, and most people I know don't usually like silent issues because they read really fast, obviously. Um, but I had a lot of fun with this one. This is actually like a prequel issue. It takes place before issue one of this series. And it lets us know when Sonata and Train first met. And that's a really cool story that I've been wanting to see. And I'm glad we got to see it using just the artwork. And it's really being able to utilize that artwork to maximum effect in issue number 12. This book's been really cool. It's been a slow creeper on me. The more and more it goes along, the more and more I'm into it. And Sonata number 12 has some great, cool 3D rendered at times artwork, but that doesn't feel too fake or too stiff or too stagnant. Um, and it absolutely flows and it works and I love it. Sonata number 12, I love a good silent comic book every once in a while. Stealth number four is here from Image Comics. Another great issue in Stealth Mystery. I really like the idea of a superhero who's an older man who has Alzheimer's, who's kind of losing his memory, kind of can't remember where he is. He's got a son who's trying to to stop him. He's got real life villains trying to stop him. And of course his son's caught up in the middle of all of that. The artwork's pretty solid. The story's been clean. It's a lean script. It doesn't waste any time. It's got great action scenes and the coloring by Tamra Bond Villain. Huh. Can we just say colors of the year right here already? I know we're like just over halfway through the year, but I think, I think Tamra, I think she's got it on lock. Stealth number four, a really solid issue. If you've been liking it, you no reason why you won't like that one. Adventure Man number three is here. Issue one was intriguing. At issue number two, I, th I think I said that I'm not gonna continue. But when I looked at the stack, I was like, you know, the stack's not that unbearable. It's not super large. Let's read Adventure Man number three. I, 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 I'm lost. It's confusing. It's not interesting to me. Um, the artwork by the Dotsons is okay, but I think even if you're a Dotsons fan, it's gonna be a little bit more rushed and not as, not as clean as you're used to. Um, but I don't know. It's, this story's not doing anything for me. Maybe, you know, a lot of times with Fraction stuff, aside from, I mean, I love some Fraction stuff, some Fraction stuff I don't. So maybe I need to read the entire trade paperback when it, when it comes out, when it's all, the first volume's all completed or whatever. But right now it's just not doing anything for me. I'm just not digging this book. And so this was 100% the final issue I was going to read. I got a little note here to talk about Devil's Highway issue number two from AWA because... I read Devil's Highway number two on my computer screen because my shop was shorted our physical copies, but that's okay. The good folks at AWA hooked me up and I got to read it and it was great. It's about truckers. This woman's, her dad is a trucker. He's gone missing, possibly killed. She thinks a trucker did it. So now she's diving into the deep and seedy world 
of truckers out there on the highway to to solve the murder and it starts going in some, some kind of weird like seven silence of the lambs direction and i really found it engaging and compelling and even better than issue number one so be on the lookout for that one devil's highway number two was really really solid so was old haunts number three i reread one and two last night to get caught up for for number three because i remember after reading issue number two i was like i feel like i'm missing something now, reading it all together, wow. And issue number three, best issue yet. The artwork, graphically, there's so many great, effective, just expertly paced bits in here. There's a double page spread that I think is just splendid. I love the artwork. It's about these three old school gangsters who are trying to clean up and sell off all their business, all their criminal business to this one guy. And now they're haunted by the ghosts of the people they've killed to get to where they are. And... And in the midst of all that, everything about this deal just gets completely thrown awry and they're all starting to lose it, come unhinged. And man, issue three was great. This was the best issue of this series yet. Think of it, about it a little bit like Sopranos as a ghost story, if that makes sense. But I'm having a lot of fun with it. Rob Williams, Ollie Masters, Lawrence Campbell, and Lee Lowridge. Loving it. Um, loving it. I'm loving a lot, but not, not everything this week. But Old Haunts number three, pretty freaking solid. Um, The Resistance, issue number four, J. Michael Straczynski, such a great first issue. And it's gotten duller and duller and duller to me, and I could get, I couldn't care after this issue. I really can't. I'm done. I'm done. And I hate it, because I think AWA's been doing some really, really good books, and I really liked Resistance at first, but the story feels sloppy. The structure of it feels all discoherent and inco in, 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 incoherent and, and inconce un uncohesive. Not cohesive. Anyway, um, the resistance, though, is just not working for me. Um, the artwork also feels sloppy and rushed, but this does feel a little bit better than the last couple from Diodato, but not quite what I'm expecting or used to from him. Um, so I, I may be done with the resistance. There's only two issues left, but there's this is a whole world that's being built up, but the world building is not compelling to me. And it's such a shame because for such a great first issue, it this one fell off for me super, super quick. From Ahoy Comics with Billionaire Island, issue number four. This was billed to me as the final issue, but it's not. There's at least got to be one more, but I'm having a lot of fun. It's a it's really cool, fun satire by Mark Russell. That's what he does, and he does it really well. He's got some things that he's saying in here, but for the most part, he's just trying to have fun, making fun of billionaires. It's about this island that these billionaires have gotten together and made, where they can go there if the world's ending, where they can go there just to do whatever they want. There's no laws and all kinds of stuff, so they got people, like, held hostage. They're, they're getting away with whatever they want, but, of course, someone comes on the island, they're like, no, we're going to stop this, and now it's all coming to a head. Had a really cool, interesting ending, and I'm very excited to see where the story's going to go from there. From Mad Cave Studios, we have Hellfighter Quinn, issue number four. It's kind of like a superhero version of Bloodsport, in a way. Um, issue number four ramps up the action, and the ending of this one, I thought, was really, really cool. Didn't really see that one coming, since Jay Sandlin and company actually nailed the ending on this one. It had me very intrigued to see what's going to happen in the final issue. Speaking of final issues, did you know Everglade Angels was just a two-issue series? I didn't. This took me completely by surprise. Um, but I thought it was an okay finish. There's a scene in here of an alligator attack that is one of the panels of the week. Absolutely. The book itself, though, is kind of okay. It kind of wraps up really, really quickly and very neatly. It leaves a little bit of a dangling thread, I guess, for this book to return. I haven't seen anything about Everglade Angels number three coming out, but this is kind of the final issue. Um, this issue number one had a good setup, and issue number two kind of wraps it up decently. So it's decent. It's kind of mediocre, but it's nothing that's going to change your life. But if you see it at your shop and you're not going to pick it up, at least flip through it to see that alligator attack scene, because that's a... That's a very effective moment. Artistically, it's actually pretty good. I like the art. I like the coloring. I like the flow and the atmosphere of that. But the story itself is just kind of bland and, and, and just kind of okay. Anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What do you think about it? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe. Click the notification bell and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.